Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I actually grew up uh, about 10 kilometers away from here. And although this picture doesn't uh, show, show it, I'm actually quite old. There's a lot of airbrushing going on in that photo. Uh, but I actually remember what was uh, on the site of this, uh, of this hotel. Anyone in the audience can tell me what it was? I know some people think I'm Greek, so it's on a corner, so it must have been the corner cafe. But actually, no, it wasn't. It was actually a parking lot. I remember it was the parking lot for the furs. Uh, and when they put the hotel here, one of my Greek grandmothers who lives on a Greek island was like, who would want to go to Rosebank? <laughs> Anyway, as you can see, I'm a, I'm a fellow of the Faculty of Actuary, so I'm an FFA, not to be confused with the CFA, that's an individual who can't face the actual exams. <laughs> Unfortunately for you, there are three actuaries on, on the panel today, uh, so I hope you all, all have had a good cup of coffee. Uh, and I see there's also two CPD points uh, on offer today as well. I think there should be three CPD points, one for each actuary that you are going to be forced to endure. But anyway, last joke for, uh, for today. Uh, there's actually uh, three types of actuaries according to the Oxford Eng English Dictionary. Uh, those who can count and those who can't count. <laughs> anyway, before joining Prudential, uh, I used to work at an investment bank. And my head of research taught me, uh, well, his advice to me was, was to always remember three things. Uh, the first thing is to make your clients laugh. And I've got a couple of giggles out of you, so we can tick that off the list. The second was to make you think, and that's really what my presentation is about today, to try and stimulate debate uh, around our investment process, and hopefully you can ask some questions a bit later. Uh, and then thirdly, and most importantly, is to make your clients money. And that's really, uh, I guess, our core focus of the entire team. Uh, we come to work every day, every month, to try and grow, grow your returns. And there's therefore also a very big thank you from the, from the equity team uh, of that 200 billion uh, that Lindsay put up there, but earlier we managed about 90 billion of equities, uh, and hopefully with your support and some good investment performance, uh, we can get to 100 billion uh, pretty quickly as well. Okay, on to the meat of the presentation. Uh, effectively, what I'm going to touch on is really value. Okay, we're a prudent value investor, but then also wanted to touch on how we think we differ from other value investors, and that really has to do with the concept of quality. And I think that this is going to be best illustrated by just running through a number of, of examples um, that you might be familiar with to try and explain our investment philosophy. Then I'll just touch on the role of management and where that can be important to an investment decision. And then I'll end off uh, just discussing our current uh, portfolios. I'll spend, I'll spend a bit of time on, on this chart. Okay, so there's various ways that you can uh, categorize the investment universe or split the investment universe. Uh, and this is one such categorization. So on the uh, horizontal axis, what actuaries like to call the x-axis, uh, is really the valuation of a stock. You can take any stock on the JSE, and you can put it into one of three buckets. Uh, it's a cheap stock, in other words, a, it's a discounted rated stock, or trades at a discount to the market. So maybe it trades on a P of 8, and the market trades in a P of 10. Okay, then you get your expensive stocks, they trade at a premium to the market, and then the rest of the universe will effectively fall into the average uh, value uh, uh, category. Okay, as I mentioned, we are prudent value investors, so you would expect a large part of our screening process and our portfolio to be biased towards value stocks. Okay? However, I think where we differ significantly from a lot of our value peers is we like to overlay a quality screen onto our investment process. So our job is not just simply to buy the cheapest stock in a particular sector. Okay, so a good example at the moment in the banks um, is First Rand and APSA. Okay, APSA is not a bad bank. They definitely though, have, had, have seen better times, and for those of you who remember the Unifor debacle, they clearly also have, have seen worse times. But first round, first round at the moment is, is, in our view, a quality bank. Their return on assets, what they generate from the advances that they lend out, uh, is at about a 50% higher return than the other banks. So we would buy first round over APSA if we could get them at the same price. In fact, even if first round was trading at a slight premium to APSA, so let's say APSA was trading at 12 times earnings, uh, and the first strand was trading at 13 or 13 and a half, we would still prefer first strand because we really want to include in our portfolio quality stocks. As I'll run through the presentation, I'll give you a bit more insight into, term, into what we really mean by, by quality. So management obviously is one aspect of quality, uh, but the quality of earnings is also very important for us. And I guess the title of the presentation, quality is not permanent. So unfortunately, you can't just buy a stock today, put it, put it in put it in the sort of bottom drawer uh, and forget about it. There is such a rapid change of technological advances that a lot of businesses that were once prosperous, 
So let's take the Ultron Group, run by the Fenter family, once considered a blue chip stock, but effectively have been disintermediated by new technology, and that stock can no longer really be considered um, a quality stock, uh, and you probably wouldn't find that uh, in our portfolios. Okay, so let's, let's move on to the examples. Uh, I'll start off with um, a very high quality company, what we like to refer to as the compounding companies. And the reason we call them compounding companies is because their earnings grow or compound year after year. Okay, mainly because there is some fundamental driver of demand for the product that they sell. Okay, so Mr. Price is a very good example. In the last 16 years shown here, there was only one occasion when earnings went backwards. Okay, why? Because like I said, there is some demand for their product. Effectively, what you have is South Africa has a growing population, so a large portion of our, of our population is, is the youth, uh, and they want access to clothing, and they want fashionable clothing. And Mr. Price has effectively positioned themselves uh, in, that, in that target market. In fact, as I guess speaker will, show, uh, will tell you a bit later, Lerato, is that effectively there's been a huge transfer of wealth via social grants to families, and effectively those families with children effectively have an income and they're able to actually buy Mr. Price's clothing. Also, what you've had in, in terms of industry dynamics, you've had Edcon, which is the owner of the Edgar's brand and the Jet brand, being taken out by private equity, uh, and they've been constrained in terms of how, of how much they can invest, leaving the way open for Mr. Price to actually uh, increase their, 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 their footprint uh, and grow their, their number of stores. So this growth in earnings has been driven by an increasing number of stores. The key question is obviously, what would you pay for such a quality earnings stream? Okay, so we could take Mr. Price's earnings, multiply it by a P of 10, and that would give you some kind of valuation anchor for what you should pay for, for Mr. Price. Okay, but let's bear in mind that the South African market trades on average through the cycle at about a P of 12. So something like Mr. Price with a quality stream of earnings, you'd probably want to pay more than 10 times. Okay, perhaps you might want to pay 20 times earnings for, for Mr. Price. In fact, if we overlay the share price, that effectively averages out to about a 16 times earnings multiple. That's what the market is prepared to pay for a quality stream of, of earnings. And when Warren Buffett says that time is the friend of a wonderful business, he's really talking about the compounding business. And the reason he says that is because a patient investor will hardly ever lose money over the long term in a stock like this. Even if you bought uh, Mr. Price at the peak there in 2007, just before the global financial crisis, even though the stock came off quite a lot with the rest of the market, because earnings continue to grow and they grew right through the financial crisis, and the market is valuing the stock off its earnings, within three or four years, a patient investor actually would have recouped his losses and then started making money again. Okay, there's no free lunches in the market. So the market doesn't really give you many opportunities to buy quality stocks. In fact, Mr. Price, in the last decade, there were only two opportunities where you could buy the stock on a PE of less than 10. One was after the global financial crisis, and the other was uh, at the start of the bull market uh, in 2003. In fact, these stocks often trade at the top end of their range. And Mr. Price has been trading north of 20 times now for a, a number of years, actually came out with results uh, earlier this month, uh, and is now trading at a record sort of 27, 28 times its earnings. And even though Prudential likes quality stocks and we're attracted to these stocks, even for us now, Mr. Price is just simply too expensive, and we've begun the process now of exiting Mr. Price uh, from our portfolios. In summary, if we use that nine, nine box categorization, Mr. Price started off its life in that green box. So it is a cheap stock and a quality stock, but over time, the appreciation that you've had has effectively moved it across into the expensive block, uh, and the team now believes that they would be able to find other investments that would give you a better return than Mr. Price over the next uh, two to three years. Okay, for the next example, I will use an index as opposed to just one company, so I've decided to use the mine index. Uh, that includes companies like BHB, Billiton, and Anglo-American. And if we look at the pattern of their earnings, they also tend to rise over time, but you'll notice it's not, like a, it's, not a, it's not in a straight line, as you saw with Mr. Price. It tends to go in cycles. Okay, so there's peaks and troughs to the earnings over time, largely because uh, these companies are driven by some kind of economic cycle globally, or at least their commodities that they produce, oil, iron, or copper, are driven by the economic cycle. Uh, and that drives, effectively, their earnings. 
Okay, again, what would you be prepared to pay for this earnings stream? What I've done here is I've just taken the earnings of these companies and multiplied by 10 for the lower band, as we did with, with Mr. Price, but then only 16 at the higher band. Okay, why? The market is not going to pay as high a multiple for a stock whose earnings are not guaranteed to grow. Okay, with Mr. Price, if the earnings this year are 3 Rand per share, it's very likely that next year they'll be above 3 Rand. But with the cyclical company, there is the chance that effectively earnings will fall, and therefore the market won't pay as high a multiple for the stated earnings of these companies. And in fact, if we overlay the price of that index over time, you'll notice that it hardly ever trades above 16 times earnings, whereas for Mr. Price, the average was actually 16, and it often traded north of, of 20 times. These stocks are actually more difficult to value than the compounders, mainly because you actually have to make two decisions. It's not just whether the stock is cheap or expensive, but where we are in the current cycle. So let's take the example of 2012, where a lot of value managers in South Africa were attracted to the mining and the resource sector. Why? Because they deemed the, they deemed the sector to be cheap. At that point in the cycle, it was trading at about 10 times, in fact, below 10 times earnings. Okay, that for a compounding company with, like Mr. Price, you could effectively buy it and almost be guaranteed to make a profit. But the issue here and the issue that we highlighted was that a number of commodities, particularly iron ore, which drives a large amount of the earnings of these companies, was very elevated because of demand from China. And because China was slowing down, there was the risk effectively that the iron ore price would fall. And if that happened, the earnings of these companies would fall and effectively uh, the index would fall as well. And that's effectively what transpired. Okay, commodity prices degraded, the earnings came off, and uh, the, the price of this index effectively went sideways. So you didn't lose money, but bear in mind that over this period, uh, the SWIX continued to rise. So on a relative basis, you underperformed by being overweight, uh, the, the mining sector. So again, if we use our nine box categorization, we would argue that most mining companies are average quality. Okay, they're cyclical, they're not as, uh, as high quality as, as a compounder. In our view, in 2012, they were actually expensive, uh, and now they are beginning to offer value. They, in our view, uh, are no, no more expensive or cheap than the average stock uh, in the market. Maybe we want to just spend some, a bit more time on the mining index itself or the mining cycle. So this is a, a graph courtesy of, of Goldman Sachs. Uh, where they really just try very simplistically to break down your mining cycle into two phases, an investment phase and an exploitation phase. And these cycles can last 10 to 30 years. The last 10 to 15 years, we've been in an extraordinary investment phase. Okay, effectively, China and to a lesser extent India have awoken from their slumber and they've needed large amount of metals to urbanize. So in China, there are cities now that didn't exist 10 years ago that are now multiples the size of Johannesburg. Okay, hopefully they have better electricity than Johannesburg does. But um, effectively, there wasn't enough metal in the world to satisfy the demand. So the mining companies effectively had to invest. And they had to invest in three ways. They had to spend money on exploration, looking for new deposits. They had to build new mines. So some of you may be aware, Anglo-American built a new mine called Minas Rio in Brazil to bring on iron ore. And where possible, they, they spent capital uh, building new shafts at existing mines. Okay, so effectively, we were in investment phase, and we're probably somewhere here at the moment. There's been a large amount of investment, and in fact, we argue that in certain commodities like iron ore, there's actually been overinvestment. And just to put that overinvestment into perspective, this is the amount of capital in dollar billions that has been spent by all the mining companies globally um, in the three largest iron ore producing countries in the world, being China, Brazil, and Australia. So Anglo-Americans' investment in Minas Rio would be somewhere in that green block. Okay? So they, together with Vale, were, were sinking money to build new, new mines. So effectively, we've had massive investment into new mines, and therefore we've had uh, a, 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 a tremendous increase in the amount of iron ore that now hits the market every year. So this, incre this incremental supply, unfortunately, is now coming to the market at a time when China, not that it, it, it's still growing, but it's not growing as fast as it used to. So it doesn't actually need all the supply that is uh, beginning to, to come out of the ground. And in fact, one of the reasons why Anglo-American has underperformed BHP Billiton in the last five years is that BHP Billiton was fortunate enough to be able to bring on new production uh, out of the Pobara region in, um, in Australia 
uh, whereas Anglo-American faced tremendous problems in Minas Rio and effectively only shipped their, their first shipment of iron ore earlier this year, uh, sort of three or four years um, too late. Now, what happens in the exploitation phase is not only will you see a decline in investment, um, so you may have seen a, news, a newspaper article a couple of days ago, a company called South32, which is the newer, newest addition to the JSC, effectively was spun out of BHB Billiton. It owns all the aluminium and manganese assets of, of, of BHB, effectively putting a number of their mines in South Africa effectively on, on care and maintenance. Okay, so you will see less investment, but you will also see most probably uh, a reduction in the price. In fact, the last time we were in an exploitation phase, we saw a 50% reduction in the real price of iron ore over a 20-year period. So we're not saying that in the next one or three years, you won't have an increase in commodity prices and a tremendous rally in some of these mining counters, but we don't believe that we are, have yet laid the foundations where we're going to have a 15 or 20-year bull market in commodities and a, and a bull market for, for mining shares. And I think you really need to bear that in mind when deciding uh, how much mining stocks you actually want in, in your portfolio. Okay, the third type of company is what we call the declining company. So here you effectively have a company or, that used to be a cyclical company or maybe even a compounding company, uh, and the company effectively enters some kind of structural decline. Okay, and that, largely that happens because the product that the company produces faces a downward trend in demand. Okay, and that's best illustrated by this object here on the screen which unfortunately the kind people at uh, Cape Town International Airport wouldn't, wouldn't allow me to bring on the plane, uh, but this is basically called a buggy whip. And I'm almost convinced that none, none of you have ever used a buggy whip in your life, and that's mainly because you all drive motor cars. Okay? Prior to the invention of the motor car, people got around by horses, and if you had a family, you also had a wagon. So you had a horse and a wagon, what the Americans like to call a buggy. Okay? And effectively, the driver of this buggy had a buggy whip, and he used to hit the horses to go faster. Bug buggy whips obviously don't exist anymore, other than in investment terminology, we use the term buggy whip for something that used to have underlying demand and now effectively has no demand. Okay, you probably are more familiar for, with these examples of modern day buggy whips. Okay, Kodak film, Nokia phone, landlines. Okay, these effectively have all been displaced by the smartphone, particularly the Apple iPhone. Okay, has basically put paid to these objects and as some of you know, Kodak, which was once a Dow component, effectively now is, is bankrupt. Okay, again, reinforcing our topic that quality is not necessarily permanent. In the South African context, we've long argued that the gold mining industry has many characteristics of a declining industry. Okay, so what we've plotted here is the amount of gold production from the industry uh, over the last 15 years or so. And what you'll see is that the amount of gold that is coming out of the ground in South Africa is reducing year after year. Okay, that is completely different if I had to measure the number of genes that Mr. Price, let's say, is selling. Not only do they have more stores every year, but they're selling more genes out of those stores every year as well. So they actually have an increasing demand for their product. As Andila will touch on a bit later, employees or workers require wages, and those wages need to increase to keep pace with inflation. So the costs of these gold companies are rising, Okay, but their production is declining, so if you looked at the average cost per unit of production, that's rising even faster, and that's effectively stripping away profitability uh, from this industry. Okay? Very broadly speaking, the profits of a gold company, you take the gold price, $1,100, and you subtract it by the costs. Okay? The profitability of this industry is effectively moving into a loss-making situation if you added things like um, depreciation onto these companies. Okay, another way to look at it effectively is that a gold company effectively is just a hole in the ground and you're extracting resources. At some point, you're going to extract all the resources out of that uh, ore body. And it doesn't matter how deep you go or advanced technology, at some point it's not going to be economically viable uh, to mine gold in, in South Africa. Okay, so similar to what we've done with the other companies, let's plot now the earnings of this gold index over time. And initially what you will see in the 90s is that it appeared to be a cyclical company. Profits seemed to be rising with peaks and trough, but at some point, and difficult to know exactly when, but this industry effectively went into, into decline. Uh, and there's two characteristics that we can see uh, which characterize it as a declining industry. Firstly, profits have gone nowhere. 
So even with the cyclical company that I showed earlier, profits were at least rising over time, even though it was happening in peaks and troughs. Here, we effectively have a flat lining of, uh, of profits. And then also, interestingly, the industry as a whole actually makes losses from time to time. Again, another negative sign that the industry uh, has entered terminal decline. Okay, these companies are quite notoriously difficult uh, to value um, because you know, what do you pay for the earning stream? Okay, so again, similar to what we showed earlier, you know, would you pay 10 times uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for these earnings or 16 times? Okay, it's very difficult to know because the, the company doesn't necessarily produce a constant stream of profits year after year. And in fact, their cash generation is also quite poor from time to time, and dividends often get suspended as well. So if we overlay the share price, you'll see initially, again, looked like it traded like a cyclical stock, but at some point there was a disconnect between the price that the market was prepared to pay and the earnings. Effectively, these investors got caught out because they were expecting a cyclical return to profitability, which effectively never transpired. And as the market has come to the realization that this industry uh, is in decline, you've seen the price of the index uh, come down as well. And as I mentioned, the SWIFT has been rising, so you've had tremendous underperformance uh, in this kind of investment. Okay, again, using our nine box categorization, you effectively had a situation where perhaps the gold stocks were of average quality, but over time, as we've moved into uh, the noughties, uh, effectively, this industry now is of poor quality. And generally, we like to avoid uh, stocks or industries that are in um, the lower category or poor quality, what some people like to call value traps, okay? particularly in the resource sector. Uh, as I'll touch on a bit later, in the industrial and the financial sector, management sometimes is able to move a company from a declining industry into one that is advancing. But it is very difficult for a mining company, particularly a single commodity mining company. Okay, so if you are mining gold in South Africa, you can't wish away the labor problems or the BEE issues that you're facing in South Africa. Okay, those are part and parcel of your environment. And also, you can't move your mine. Effectively, you're mining uh, a reef, and, and that reef is based in South Africa, and there's nothing you can do to alter the fortunes of, of the company. Okay, it's slightly different, as I mentioned, for uh, the financial and the industrials, because here you're actually able, management, effective management, can actually shift the company from a declining industry uh, to an advancing industry. Okay, so just to reiterate the points we've made, an industry has a life cycle. Okay, so it starts off as a nascent industry growing very fast. So in the 50s, for example, gold mining was a growth industry. There were hundreds of gold mining companies. Uh, over time, effectively, they hit some kind of maturity. You see consolidation, and ultimately, effectively, the industry tips over uh, into decline. Okay, but effective management, if it can recognize the trend of demand, can actually shift the company from a declining industry into one that is advancing. And I think Sunlum is a very good example of a financial company that has been able to do that. <clears throat> so some of you who were around in 1998 may remember when Sunlum demutualized, it was really a Cape-based or Belleville-based life insurer that sold <clears throat> pure life insurance products to a saturated middle, largely white middle market uh, consumer in South Africa. Okay? Effectively, that industry is an industry in decline. Okay? The number of white, middle-aged people wanting life insurance is effectively in decline, but Sunlam actually recognized that, particularly under the stewardship of Johan van Sale, and they tried to shift the company away from that. So what did they do? <clears throat> Firstly, they went into different income markets, so they went into the lower end of the market, selling almost identical products, but to a target market that wasn't saturated. Okay, then in 2006, they bought a company called African Life, and then they again went into Africa, Botswana, Kenya, Ghana, much faster growing economies, but also far less penetrated with insurance products. They also had much better command of those new, of those new markets. In South Africa, they had lots of competition from your traditional competitors like Old Mutual and new competitors like ourselves uh, on, the, on the unit trust side. Uh, but in places like Botswana, they went into a country and they had a 60-65% market share. So tremendous pricing power. Uh, and, and ability to make very good profits. Also, even on the investment side, uh, they went more into investments and into linked products, and they built the Glacier platform, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. 
Originally, Glacier was called Innofin, and when they launched it, many investors, including myself, thought that this was never really going to work. That business last year made about 340 million rand of profits before tax. This year will probably make 400 million rand of profits before tax. Effectively, Glacier on its own is now a medium-sized company. Okay, and as you know, Sunlam has been a tremendous success and has been, they've been able to enrich the investor. Another industry, which in my opinion is dead, is effectively paper newspapers. Okay, newspaper publishing. These titles are effectively titles of the Nationale Pass, or more commonly known as NASPAS. Okay, NASPAS has, I guess, the honor of being the one industrial company that has been able to shift from a declining industry into an advancing industry more than once. Okay, initially, they moved from pure newspaper printing and magazine printing into pay TV, Mnet, etc. And then thereafter, they used the cash flows <coughs> from pay TV to start to invest in internet and media assets. Okay, they've had some tremendous failures, but they've also had some tre tremendous successes uh, with investments like MailRU and in particular Tencent. Okay, so effectively, most of this most recent rally in Naspass really driven by their investment in Tencent, a Chinese internet company. If you contrast that with another company in South Africa called Caxton, which thought they would just stick with the knitting in terms of uh, media and, and newspaper publishing, you can see the massive divergence in the performance of these two share prices. It's probably not clear because we've actually logged the vertical axis, but in 2002, these companies had the same market capitalization, about two billion. At the moment, Nasbass is 100 times the size of Caxton. Okay, to put that into a return space, Caxton has given you about a 9% return compound uh, over these 13 years. Uh, that's probably one or two percentage points higher than you could get in a government bond. Nuspass has given you about 55-56%. Okay, using the rule of 72, forgive your market capitalization is doubling every 18 months. Okay, apologies for the number slide, but this is quite important to try to understand how our philosophy and what I've talked about today actually feeds into our portfolio and into the numbers. Okay, so the first uh, column is the Prudential Equity Fund uh, and some statistics for that. And then the second column is uh, the benchmark, in this case, the average uh, equity unit trust. The first box effectively shows you that you, with the Prudential Equity Fund, you're getting exposure to a fund that is actually on average cheaper than the market. Okay, so our fund uh, currently has a P of about 15, uh, the market is about 15.6, and we also have a high yield. Equally as important though, you're not foregoing quality and you're not foregoing growth. Okay, so you have a portfolio that is actually forecast to grow faster than the market in general. Okay, so the, the forecast earnings growth of the stocks that we own forecast to grow at 13.5%, the other stocks are forecast to only grow at 9%. And effectively, I guess, this sentence here is probably the most important. We are aiming to construct a cheaper portfolio, but of higher quality stocks and without foregoing the growth for the investor. If we look at how that translates into the, the portfolio, this is the portfolio as at 31 May. If we start with the bar charts on the left-hand side, from the top, dealing with the resources first. At the moment, we're underweight oil and gas, which effectively is Sassel. Uh, I think we correctly predicted the decline in the iron ore price, but we were caught a bit unawares by the extent and the severity at which the oil price came off last year, particularly post OPEC's decision in November uh, not to try and protect the price. So this time last year, we were overweight Sassel and effectively have been scrambling to go underweight uh, as the earnings effectively have been decimated by uh, the decline in the oil price. Okay, I did touch on the mining stocks. We're underweight those but we are overweight non-mining resources, which is really your paper stocks, the likes of a Sapi or a Mondi. If we look at the industrial stocks, underweight construction. Construction is a, is a sector that we think is very cheap at the moment, but it's all about the question of trying to time the cycle. Okay, these cycles, again, can be very long. Uh, for those of you who saw Avengers trading statement yesterday, it doesn't look like the cycle uh, is turning at all. Okay, they basically warned on their profits. Profits will be down 50% from, from last year. So a lot of those construction companies still struggling. Uh, in terms of the consumer companies, we're still a bit concerned about the consumer, so we're generally underweight those consumer-facing stocks. As I mentioned, we're selling out of Mr. Price. We don't own any ShopRite, although we do have some pick and pay. Pick and pay we see a bit more as a self-help story or turnaround, uh, and therefore have decided to take some exposure to that. 
The healthcare stocks, we're underweight. Uh, Netcare is one of our top overweight positions, but really is one of the few, if only, uh, healthcare stocks that we own. You'll see Aspen, also a healthcare stock, is one of our biggest underweights, uh, and we don't own any of the other hospital groups. Uh, underweight the, tel the telcos and overweight the financials. The financials is really made up of an overweight in the banks, an underweight in the insurers, and then a small overweight in some of the other non-bank financials, things like the JSC, Peregrine, etc. cetera. Uh, Zandile will touch a little on real estate, but we don't see that much value uh, in real estate and therefore are underweight real estate within, within the fund. Maybe just to spend some time in conclusion on uh, just some comments on the top overweights and underweights. All Mutual is a stock that has gone through tremendous change uh, since being caught out in the global financial crisis, and we still think there's more restructuring uh, to come there. This is really a stock that we own um, in spite of management uh, instead of because of management. Okay, there's still quite a lot of uh, value that we think that can be unlocked. In fact, in your packs, there's an article that I wrote in the latest Consider This, just comparing Old Mutual to Sunlum. Increasingly, as Old Mutual divests from its UK and US operations, it will look more and more like Sunlum, but the market is paying an unhealthy premium for Sunlum relative to Mutual. Okay, so Sunlum trading at about one and a half times embedded value, and Mutual trading at about one times embedded value, so massive discrepancy. Okay, no actuarial presentation is complete without using the word embedded value, so now I've got that out the way. But you'll have a look at that article. It, it makes for, I think, quite an interesting read. Investec, actually quite similar to Old Mutual, also got, got caught out in the global financial crisis, bought some poor assets in 2007 in Kensington, but now, finally, as the UK market and the European market uh, is beginning to recover, they're being able to divest of some of those assets and take that capital and put it into higher producing regions uh, and increasing uh, their returns. On the underweight side, it's really a whole host of industrial stocks that we think are quite expensive, uh, particularly SAB Miller, which would really fit the bill of a quality company that's been able to grow earnings consistently over time, but is, in our view, just uh, too expensive at this point in the cycle. Okay, and then moving on to my last slide, really just looking at the performance of the fund over time. Generally, what we've seen is that the average equity unit trust fund in the market has actually underperformed uh, the All Share Index, uh, while the Prudential Equity Fund uh, has actually outperformed over time. Um, and that's obviously a very good performance. I guess I can talk up the team here because I wasn't actually responsible for a large part of this performance. I think the guys have done a, a sterling job to create this uh, outperformance over time. And I guess our task is to continually generate performance uh, for our funds. And again, I thank you for, uh, for, our, for your support. Okay, before I hand over to Sandile, again, just a, a repetition. If you've got any questions, uh, there will be the roving mic, uh, but uh, you can also SMS your questions or email your questions. Thanks very much.